Thank you very much. Rob, you're a hard act to follow, you know. You. And I, oh, I just want to remind you, Rob, that uh, Sophocles wrote Oedipus Rex when he was 90. <laughs> <laughs> it's a short work, I'll grant you. It's, it's, uh, it's not long, but it's powerful. Influence on me. Well, I won't go into that. Uh, first, I want to thank once more my classmates of 1951. There was a vote at the end of the last century. What was the greatest class Washington Lee ever had? 1951. But, I mean, I don't know who counted the ballots. <laughs> but, uh, uh, anyway, it's, it's really moving to know what my classmates have done in my honor. I, I'm trying to find the right word for it. It makes me feel posthumous. <laughs> um, no, they are great people. <laughs> they have, they've, they've done well by me. Um, and it's a real s special pleasure to, uh, to introduce Colin McCann. Uh, let me just preface this by saying that uh, Sinclair Lewis, who was our first Nobel Prize winner in literature, wrote one of the greatest essays about writing. It was called How to Write. And the first sentence was, first sit down. <laughs> and I, can, I, can, I can understand that completely because uh, so many writers, I'm not, I, I'm not uh, apart from them, and dance around the project until you wonder if there's going to be anything left of them before they finally sit down and answer. But I have another uh, axiom, which is, before you sit down, leave the building. Uh, leave your study and go take a look uh, at, uh, go take a look at the world. This was a great, this was understood by the great 19th century writers. You had to picture Dickens out in the uh, Thames River with a, a, a man who uh, uh, makes a living scooping up dead bodies and taking the money out of the pockets. Um, you have to think of uh, uh, Zola going down into the, the mines in France to write Germinal. Um, he posed as a, uh, an investigator wearing a top hat and uh, but he was really in league with the, uh, uh, with, with the miners. This was just, this was second nature. But also in France in the late, uh, uh, well, in the 1880s really, there arose a, a what uh, Catole Mendes, who was a minor French poet, called the charming aristocracy. This was at a time when Zola and Maupassant were the most popular writers uh, in the world, probably. Um, and he said, oh, we don't write for the masses anymore. Um, we write for a charming aristocracy. Well, that, that charming aristocracy has been the curse of our literature ever since the Second World War. All of our greatest writers were realists to a, uh, to a fault. They wanted to get down, as uh, Alfred Cases once put it, every last detail of American life. They may have been sarcastic about it, they may have reviled it, but they wanted to get it all down uh, on, on paper. Uh, that's gone out of, it's really gone out of, and now the, the big thing is the, the psychological novel. People whose psychology you want to study have no background. Uh, they're just there with their, uh, with, uh, with their psyches. Uh, Colin McCann is, is such a delight to discover in an arid period like this, uh, I, well, I, I think of it that way, I have the American, uh, uh, the American novel. Uh, I want to sit down with him after this and just learn about all his uh, reporting techniques. Uh, and one of his books, uh, Zoli, which is about um, gypsies, uh, started with, correct me if I'm wrong, it's also good though, don't um, it started with research, library research, and so on here in this country. Then he ended up going to Europe through four different countries, just talking to gypsies, doing uh, you know, uh, 
observing uh, gypsy customs, gypsy, uh, zippy, gypsy life. Uh, and in uh, Let the Great World Spin, you see this done to the maximum. You t I'm just spellbound by, and uh, awed um, by, the, uh, by the work that has gone into the book and the knowledge that has been pulled out and all related in the most exciting, certainly exciting literary way <laughs> with uh, the walk across the trade, the, the, uh, uh, the trade centers in New York between the two towers. Uh, and he, he, Petit is not mentioned, but he's described. Uh, and the, the way this becomes a theme is, is uh, I was just, I was spellbound and uh, greatly and, and greatly uh, surprised. And one of the, there's so many different types of characters. But unlike uh, Das Passos, and for that matter, uh, John O'Hara, um, he doesn't he doesn't have simply parallel narratives that sort of come together. Uh, different characters come together at the end. Uh, he has them taking off from one another immediately in the way that life now goes. Uh, at, at one point, a, um, um, a Catholic priest who's, who's devoted his life really to uh, prostitutes and real, uh, real down and outers uh, is, uh, <clears throat> is riding on the FDR Drive in New York to uh, <clears throat> with uh, a, a young woman, Jaslyn is her name, who is the second generation prostitute, uh, a third generation I think it is, her mother encouraged her to get into this particular trade. It was steady work and uh, <laughs> lucrative. And they have this car again, the priest has this old van, and he's not going very fast on the FDR drive, and behind him comes a car that just bumps the, the rear bumper slightly. But it's enough to knock the car off course. And it crashes and they both die. You know, that doesn't happen very often in novels. Uh, it happens in life. You have a main character who's suddenly wiped out midway through the, through, it doesn't, it happens in life, it doesn't happen often in books. Um, they turn out to be, the people in the car behind them turn out to be a, a pair of sort of late blooming hippies of the 1970s. Uh, and almost immediately thereafter you get their particular uh, their particular story. Well, it's no use to my going on and and, and telling you all these uh, details. You'll, if if there's anyone here who has not read Let the Great World Spin, you're in for a marvelous time. The, the suspense, the characterization, uh, it simply couldn't be better. But I would now like to turn this over to Mr. Colin McCann himself. I am incredibly honored and uh, incredibly nervous now, too. Thank you so much. Uh, you don't know what this, th th this means to me. I, um, I was sitting here thinking that I, I, I wish I could somehow um, beam this all back uh, to my father in Dublin because so much of everything goes back to our fathers, but um, so much of, of, of being here in this moment and the coincidence, the vast coincidence of this moment um, has to do with uh, my father, has to do with Mr. James Joyce, and has to do with Mr. Mr. Tom Wolfe. Um, uh, also, I want to say um, I'm delighted. I didn't get a chance to, 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 to meet uh, uh, Mrs. Wolfe, uh, Sheila, uh, yet, but you're here, there. Hello, how are you? Such a pleasure. Um, and um, so I'm nervous, I'm gonna, and, and, but the best way to get out of your nerves is to say that you're nervous, right? <laughs> um, 
My dad was a, um, a newspaper editor um, in Dublin in um, the 60s and 70s and he used to come home with books um, and I would steal out to his little writing shed in suburban Dublin and there would be uh, Ferlinghetti and there would be Brodigan and there would be Kerouac and Ginsberg and there would be, of course, Tom Wolfe. And I remember uh, being a teenager and uh, reading uh, the right stuff and reading the electric Kool-Aid acid test and knowing somehow that he in particular was shifting my whole universe sideways and that as somebody who wanted to write and at the age of 12 in fact I, I began reporting um, I was reporting on local soccer matches um, I began um, experimenting uh, in, in, in style and um, you know quite honestly in making things up as well um, <laughs> I used to have to report three or four different football matches like in an afternoon because you'd only get paid like five pounds per, per football match. So I'd go along afterwards and ask people what the match was like and then, and then write all about it. So I was lying at an early age. You know? <laughs> um, but it was in incredibly important to me. And then um, in the 80s when I came over to the United States, um, and, uh, and, and, and had a chance to, 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 to dwell in this country and then um, to read Bonfire at the Vanities, which is um, I, I, anybody who has read um, uh, Let the Great World Spin, Let the Great World Spin is a pale shadow to Bonfire at the Vanities and enormously um, influenced by it. And, and so we get our voice from the voices of others and so much of my voice uh, has come from um, being able to read um, Tom Wolfe and so much has come from my father and then so much has come from from uh, different generations um uh, down through the years and I wanted to talk about one other book um, and, and, and then move into the art of knowing the world and the art of fiction and that's another uh, uh, one of the other great books of the 20th century uh, Ulysses by, uh, by James Joyce now in order to tell you a little bit about Ulysses I want to tell you another story about my father and when I was 10 years old I went to a football game in England, uh, went across on the boat and then the train and went down to Highbury and went through a football game. My favourite team, Stoke City, were playing against Arsenal. But afterwards, my father, we were coming out of the stadium, he took my hand and he said to me, um, uh, come on, you know, he's hold, holding my hand tight and we went into a, um, an off-licence, a liquor store. Now my father didn't really drink and he bought a bottle of whiskey and I knew that there was something odd going on at that stage. Um, and then we went to a, 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 another shop and bought a carton of um, John Player Blue cigarettes. My dad never smoked. And I knew definitely something was going on at that stage. We got on a bus and he said, you're on your way to meet your grandfather. Now my grandfather lived in, 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 in London and all I knew at that stage was that he was a sort of uh, uh, one of those Irish men of silence, exile and cunning. But he had silence, exile, cunning and whiskey added in. <laughs> and he was dying in a nursing home and we went up the stairs and uh, I, st I stood in the doorway and my grandfather said, who's that? And my dad said, well, it's, it's, uh, it's Sean. And he said, who's that with you? And he said, it's your grandson, Colm. And my uh, granddad said, ah, another feckin' McCann. <laughs> Funny way to meet your grandfather, but I gave him the whiskey. My dad wouldn't allow me to give him the, cig the, the cigarettes. It was uh, interesting. Gave him the whiskey uh, and sat up on the bed and he began to tell me stories uh, of his life. But you know what? I never really knew my grandfather and that was the only one time um, in uh, my life that I had a chance to, to sit with him and I've always wondered about him. Um, and then in my 20s, at the same time that I was uh, reading uh, uh, Bonfire of the Vanities, going over uh, other American work, I, I began to get into Irish work as well and I read Ulysses. And I didn't realize it at the time, but my grandfather had been alive on June 16th, 1904 in Dublin, and his own father had been almost the same age as Leopold Bloom, the hero or anti-hero of um, Ulysses. And I stepped into that work, work of fiction 
And for the first time ever, I began to truly recognize who my grandfather was, what sort of streets he had walked through, what sort of maze, what sort, what, what sort of atmosphere, what, what might have been going through his, his father's mind. Um, maybe, what, maybe even through uh, his mother's mind with the Molly Bloom soliloquy, that naughty soliloquy. Um, it was an extraordinary thing for me to enter this piece of fiction and to take from it a further knowledge of what I knew was absolutely real. To be able to supplement the dream of my grandfather's life with the, 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 the uber dream of what uh, had been created by, uh, by James Joyce. In other words, it seemed to me that the art of knowing the world was not only through the art of, of, of telling, but in the art of imagination, not only on uh, Joyce's part, but on the part of uh, the very lucky reader who got a, a chance to dwell inside uh, that book. And I began to learn at that age that um, creative reading is just as important as uh, creative writing. And so, um, for me, what, what's, um, what's extraordinarily important is that we are an accumulation of voices. And I pretty much can guarantee you that I would not be here uh, but for the generosity of, 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 of this gentleman here. Um, because it opened up my world in the most extraordinary way that I was able to tell those stories. There were a couple of other writers like that. Um, there was an Irish writer by the name of Benedict Kiley who was very important to me. Um, and then later on, John Berger and uh, people like Michael Ondaatje were, were um, very important to me in that way. But what it struck me and what I would like to talk about today uh, is that boldness that was there, the, 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 the boldness of invention and the boldness of being right on the edge of the, of, of, the, of the real world and creating another world. Kurt Vonnegut says you should be continually jumping off of cliffs and developing your wings on the way down. And I, I feel that, 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 that way and, and what interests me is the boldness of the non Autobi the non-autobiographical imagination. And it strikes me that we tell stories, certainly I tell stories because I'm somewhat sick of the world. Uh, and we need stories in the same way that we need children to create what isn't yet there. Uh, stories, and notice I don't quite say fiction because I have a bit of a quarrel with the word fiction. Stories create what is yet to come. Uh, a sentence spun from the imagination is a powerful embrace of what is new. And literature proposes possibilities and then makes truths of them. And it seems to me that in literature we are given this profound evidence of being alive. And this, to me, is a moral argument for living in the world, embracing the world, doing what Zola did by living his life out loud, and also a moral argument for a sustained, uh, a sustained exercise of the imagination at the same time. Turgenev said about language is that you have to treat this mighty weapon well and carefully because in the right hands it can work miracles. And in the right hands it can work miracles because it can introduce us to who we are and who we have been down through these different generations. And in the end what's at issue here is how we live and how we live is governed it seems to me by how we tell our stories. We all tell stories in, in, in different ways and for different reasons. We tell stories 
for people to fall in love with us. We tell stories for people to give us money. We tell stories to our children so that they, might, they, they go to sleep at night. We tell stories to other children that, that they go to war. And there are so many reasons to, to tell stories. And what we do when we enter the world of storytelling is that we enter the most stunning democracy um, that we have. Because e everybody has a story. And everybody has a deep need to tell a story. Now, I learned this also in, 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 from, 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 from reading the electric Kool-Aid acid, acid test in, in, in ways. Because uh, I grew up in um, suburban Dublin. I had a very safe childhood. I used to laugh with Frank McCourt, the great Frank McCourt, saying I was really annoyed at him because he got all the misery in Ireland. <laughs> I said, you bastard, I mean, I want some of it at least. <laughs> but I had the worst possible thing that you could want for, um, for uh, a, 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 a novelist. I had a happy childhood. <laughs> Dreadful thing. So at the age of 21, uh, when I was working in the newspapers in Dublin, I went across to, um, to Cape Cod. And I'm sitting in a cottage in Hyannis one night, and there was about, oh, there was about 25 of us there, Tom. And uh, we were overserved, shall we say, right? And uh, so I decided, you know what we should all do? We should all get a bus. Right? And we should buy a bus and we, could, we should uh, sort of go across the country, you know, in an Irish electric Kool-Aid acid test or something like that, you know? And everyone was like, yeah, let's do that, that's fantastic, man, that's brilliant. And I went down the next day to check out the price of a bus and insurance and all that sort of stuff. Well, lo and behold, when I got back that night, people were like, ah. Me mammy, mm, she might not be very happy if I don't come home, or oh, I have to go to college, and oh, you know. And before, it, it went from a bus, to being a little van, to becoming a bicycle. <laughs> I took a bicycle across the United States uh, for a year and a half. I did 12,000 miles. I knew that at a certain stage I had to learn. I had to learn uh, to be at the edge. I have always believed that, 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 that uh, emigrants in some way sort of purposefully wound themselves. They put themselves in a, in a difficult situation almost to keep themselves awake for their home country. Um, and in certain ways that's what I was doing. But I also knew that I had this middle class uh, upbringing and I wanted to, to know what, what, what sort of world was out there. And um, I came through uh, Virginia. I went, started up in Boston, went all the way down to Florida, across to New Orleans, into Texas, down to Mexico, up New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, Canada, down, finished in San Francisco of all places, uh, where I was also overserved. Um, <laughs> but um, in the course of that, that's when I began to understand this idea um, about um, the uh, democracy of others. And really, when it comes down to it, the other is the most interesting thing of all. Um, uh, the act of getting to know the real world is really the art of being able to lose oneself. Becoming other, and yet at the same time dwelling in the world, is the thing uh, that to me makes me feel most acutely alive. Um, I tell my students, I teach at Hunter College, I tell my students the very first day um, that, uh, well, first thing I tell them is that I, I, I can't teach them anything. And they're like, huh? Came all this way, and you're not going to be able to teach me anything? I, and then I say, well, I can teach desire, stamina, perseverance, and magic, and beauty. And they're all like, ah, that's, how can you teach us that? And I, my very first lesson is that you don't, you don't write what you know. You write towards what you want to know. It seems to me that Tom Wolfe has spent his whole writing life writing towards what he wants to know in the most majestic and perfect manner. There has been a, a, a lesson for everybody who, who has come, uh, come up and been influenced and come up behind him sort of in his, in his draft, if you will, and drafting behind him. Um, and in writing towards what you want to know, or even in writing what you don't know, you learn things that you knew but you weren't entirely conscious of in the first place. It's like, uh, ultimately, it's, 
it's physically, uh, philosophically impossible to write what you don't know. But in the, in, in, in the leap of getting, writing about what you supposedly don't know, you learn things that were there, that are written so deep in our DNA. Uh, we all have access to it, because we know when we read a good book, we recognize these characters. You know the thrill that you get when you recognize those characters and that person is true and real, and you somehow empathize with them, you somehow feel their hurt. One of the beautiful things to me about literature is that you can feel such hurt, you can cry, you can laugh, you can weep, and you don't come out with any scars the next day, you know? And you don't have the hangover, or you don't have the, the, the bills to pay, or anything like that. But the, the beautiful thing about, about literature and the art of becoming other is uh, the consequence that you can bring to, uh, to, to, to other people's lives. And so, um, I'm... I'm uh, conscious that I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, Let the Great World Spin. I really, um, I feel embarrassed that I'm here and, and, and there were so two beautiful um, introductions and because um, I, I think we should be talking about somebody else rather than, than, than talking about me. But I want to give you a little background into uh, Let the Great World Spin and then read you a couple of little sections. Um, and then talk a little bit more about the all-embracing nature or, or, or democracy of, 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 of storytelling. Um, I'm, uh, I was in New York on 9-11, uh, uh, like a lot of people, and um, I will never forget my uh, father-in-law was in the first building to come down, or the, the first building to be hit, the second building to come down, um, and he got out. Uh, and, but he came out into that weird glaucoma storm of debris uh, that was down in, uh, um, around the World Trade Center. And he walked the five miles up to our place on the Upper East Side. You know, you, yourself and myself are, are, are probably the two least fashionable novelists in New York because we're not living in, the, in Brooklyn. <laughs> we, both, we both live on the Upper East Side. Terrible, terrible admission. Um, but he walked all the way up and, and he was covered in all this dust and my three-year-old daughter at that stage jumped up into his arms and, um, and then she ran away. And I said to her, Isabella, what's wrong? She said, well, Poppy's burning. And, 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 um, and I said, no, Poppy's not burning. There's smoke on his clothes from, the, the, there was some fires downtown. And she said, no, 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 you don't understand. Uh, he's burning from the inside out. She's, and, 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 and when she said that, I knew, well, I knew even that particular day that I was going to write about 9-11, that it was my job to, 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 to do so. It's not every novelist's job or every writer's job to do so, I wouldn't say so. But I knew on a personal level it would be um, my job to try to do so. I was working on Zoli at that stage, and, then, um, I, and, and um, I wasn't prepared to let that go. Um, and I did go across to Slovakia and, um, and to the Ukraine and to Poland and lived with gypsies for a while. But all the time in the back of my mind, I knew that I would like to write about 9-11. And um, the, the, the image that uh, sustained me the most uh, was the image of creation. The incredible image of Philippe Petit walking the tightrope between the, the, the two towers in August 1974. And why was that? Well, because I think it was such a brazen act of beauty that it lives in perfect opposition to, to, to the brazen act of genius and cowardice that brought the towers down. Um, and that in some way, as the years went on and I began to write about it, I wanted to write about grace, I wanted to write about recovery, I wanted to write about beauty, I wanted to write about these things that I'd been taught to write about by the great writers um, who had gone before me. Um, and so then I began to look at 1974, and in 1974 I would have been nine years old, um, and, I, and in, in, I would have been in Ireland at, at that stage. Um, but I began to look at 74, and the soldiers were coming home from Vietnam, and uh, the internet, which was called the ARPANET, or the DARPANET, was just kicking off. Uh, there were questions of liberation theology. There were questions of, of, of faith and belonging, all these things that were going on. And it seemed to me to match over perfectly into the era that I was living in, and that I could use the tightrope walk as a sustained image to talk 
Maybe only about the tightrope walk. Maybe it's only that particular story and New York in, in, in 1974. Or maybe if I could do it properly, um, it would also be a book about you know who we are now. Uh, and um, so I was taking this uh, this non-fiction event, I suppose, uh, this true event, and manipulating it just like I was doing when I was 12 years old um, and um, I wanted to write about the symphony of the city uh, I wanted to write my bonfire of the vanities uh, in many ways and um, so I want to just read a little section from the uh, just a half a page from the start of the book to give you a little flavor and then uh, talk a little bit more about about the book itself those who saw him hushed on Church Street, Liberty, Cortland, West Street, Fulton, Vesey. It was a silence that heard itself, awful and beautiful. Some thought at first that it must have been trick at a light, something to do with the weather, an accident of shadow fall. Others figured it might be the perfect city joke. Stand around and point upward until people gathered, tilted their heads, nodded, affirmed, until all were staring upward at nothing at all, like waiting for the end of a Lenny Bruce gag. But the longer they watched, the surer they were. He stood at the very edge of the building, shaped dark against the grey of the morning, a window washer maybe, or a construction worker, or a jumper. Up there, at the height of 110 stories, utterly still, a dark toy against the cloudy sky. He could only be seen at certain angles so that the watchers had to pause at street corners, find a gap between buildings or meander from the shadows to get a view unobstructed by cornice work, gargoyles, balustrades, roof edges. None of them had yet made sense of the lines strung at his feet from one tower to the other. Rather, it was the man shape that held him there. Their necks craned, torn between the promise of doom and the disappointment of the ordinary. And I suppose that's, um, you know, we are all torn between the promise of doom and um, the disappointment of the ordinary. And we all live on a tightrope, um, whether that tightrope be a quarter of a mile in the sky or sometimes five feet off the ground or even a couple of inches off the ground. Um, and, th and they were the characters that I wanted to get to know. Another one of the characters, I spent a lot of my time as a novelist, um, as Robert so beautifully put uh, er earlier on, like at the margins, at the edges. I used to think, quite honestly, that, 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 that the, poor were, or the poor and the anonymous were more valuable, certainly as a literary tool. Um, and so, yes, I lived with the homeless people for, uh, on and off for a year and a half in the subway tunnels. I'd written about gypsies and, and, and I had gone to the margins. And, uh, and, and one of the things that struck me about living in New York was, was that I wasn't being entirely honest. Um, and I wanted to write about um, the people in my own neighborhood. So I invented a character. She lives on Park Avenue. Um, her name is Claire. And um, she... Uh, her son goes off to war, um, goes off to Vietnam to, uh, to, to work with, in computers in Vietnam. And this is just a small part of, of Claire's particular story. She wanted to tell him so much on the tarmac the day he left. The world is run by brutal men and the surest proof is their armies. If they ask you to stand still, you should dance. If they ask you to burn the flag, wave it. If they ask you to murder, recreate. Theorem, anti-theorem, corollary, anti-corollary. Underline it twice, it's all there in the numbers. Listen to your mother, listen to me, Joshua. Look me in the eyes, I have something to tell you. But he stood buzz-haired and red-cheeked in front of her and she said nothing. Say something to him, that shine to his cheeks. Say something, tell him, tell him. But she just smiled. Solomon pressed a star of David into his hands and turned away and said, be brave. She kissed his forehead goodbye. She noticed the way the back of his uniform creased and uncreased in perfect symmetry. And she knew, she just knew the moment she saw him go, that she was seeing him go forever. 
Hello, Central, give me heaven. I think my Joshua's there. Oh, I can't indulge this heart sickness. No, spoon the coffee out and line the tea bags up. Imagine endurance. There's a logic to that. Imagine and hang on. So, how is it being dead, son? And would I like it? Now, for a bit of levity, because we all need a bit of levity, I have to tell you that there is a 38-year-old um, a grandmother um, in the book who is uh, a hooker, and she is, yes, a third generation, or well, she's second generation, but is three generations. And uh, I had a great time writing her. I really did. Uh, and part of the technique was like, you know, going along, hanging out with cops in, 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 in the Bronx, trying to find cops who had been around in the 1970s. There were no hookers around from, from the 1970s, or at least nobody who admitted to it. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I, I found boxes and boxes of rap sheets and went through the rap sheets and things like that to try and get a language for this woman. Um, and I joke with my wife that this little section um, of the book where she just, this is just one little story that she tells, this is the only semi-autobiographical part of um, this novel. And you'll know from the, um, from the second sentence why that is. I got it another trick I thought I recognized. He was young, but bald on top. <laughs> the bald spot was very white, like a little ice rink on top of his head. He got a room in the Waldorf Astoria. The first thing he did was he pulled the curtains tight and he fell on the bed and he said, let's get it on. I was like, wow, do I know you, honey? He looked at me hard and said, no. Are you sure? I said, oh, cutesy and shit, you look familiar. No, he said, real angry. Hey, take a chill pill, honey. I said, I'm only axing. So I pulled off his belt and unzipped him and he moaned. Oh yeah, 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 like they all do. And he closed his eyes and he kept on moaning. And then, I don't know why, but I figured it out. It was the guy from the weather report on CBS. <laughs> Except he wasn't wearing his toupee. That was his disguise. So I finished him off and got myself dressed and I waved goodbye, but I turned at the door and said to him, Hey man, it's cloudy in the east, to the wind at ten knots and a chance of snow. <laughs> there I was, cracking myself up. <laughs> I suppose I like characters like that. Like I like the, the mother who's in grief. I like the, 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 the prostitute who is... Um, uh, prepared to, 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 to embrace humor and sadness because I don't really want to be myself. I sort of wake up in the morning and look at myself and say, oh, Jesus Christ, I have to spend 24 hours with that guy? Uh, it's so much fun to, be, uh, to, 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 to roll away and to be other, to inhabit the skin. Um, Dylan Thomas wrote about um, adventures in the skin trade. Um, it seems to me that um, this is one of the great privileges of being a reader, um, and certainly one of the great privileges of, of, of being a writer. And that is, it, it is my job uh, to uh, go away from myself. Um, I think that if we only write about ourselves, we probably have one, maybe one and a half books inside us. Um, but if we, if we want to write about the world around us, we can, we, we, there is an endless seven billion stories that, 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 that are there in front of us. Um, and, uh, you know, the, uh, which gets to the, to the purpose of, 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 of literature and these legends of ours. Um, I would say that they have, to be, they have to be valid and they have to be real and they have to be angry and they have to be truthful. They have to have a, a balance of passion and humility. We must know the necessity and complexity of failure. Literature, the job of literature, should be to oppose the monstrous cruelties and break the silence of events, portray the mystery of others or the misery of others, oppose, be in opposition, speak of experience however bitter or lacerating. It should discover the hope that these words will somehow, someplace, someday be heard. It has to shock, it has to seduce, it has to want to drag us out of our stupor. And I'm an optimist. But the suffering of the past and the evil of the, uh, the suffering of the present and the evil of the past is unlikely to be redeemed by a future era of universal happiness. 
Yet still, I believe that literature can be a wall or a stay or a small foothold against despair. Evil is a constantly ineradicable truth. But if so, there must be a corollary that truth there is, is, and exists there to be understood. The beauty of literature, like Ulysses, like everything that I learned in my youth from my father, like everything that Mr. Wolf has done, the beauty of literature is in its ability to last. This is not a consolation prize. The word fiction comes from the Latin to shape. Fiction doesn't lie. Fiction shapes things. Literature reveals a truth that the world so often obscures or wants to obscure. It's in the small, it's in the anonymous, it's in the real, it's in the imagined. The writer should live in both worlds, both the real and the imagined. The imagined comes from the real, and the real then, therefore, is shaped by the imagined. This to me uh, is important because there is a degraded discourse uh, around the idea of literature these days. There's also a degraded discourse around the idea of optimism. When I wrote Let the Great World Spin, what I wanted to write about was about joy and recovery and the ability for a certain amount of light to hold its own. I think we have to go through the dark in order to find the light. I don't think we recognize the light unless we have embraced the dark first. This is not sentimental. It is, however, full of sentiment. And I would say that we cannot let anybody take away our optimism, that the best optimist can and should be a cynic first, and then get through the cynicism to the real world, to the availability of the real world on the other side. So much good education, so much good living, is learning how to vault cynicism, get beyond it, drag it with us into the world of the optimistic. So the function of the novelist is hopefully to talk about grace and beauty, uh, and um, also to have a good time. I will uh, say that the great Frank McCourt said to me once, he said, never let the truth get in the way of a good story, young fella. <laughs> Did you meet, you, you met Frank a lot, right? He was great, right? I mean, what a fantastic man. Um, and a, a, another person whom um, I, I feel honored to have been um, shaped by. I'm going to read uh, one last section um, of, of, of the novel, um, towards the end of the novel, um, and then I believe I open it up for, for questions. I have to make sure that I'm not going too, too long on my time. Um, and I think the question shouldn't be for me, but it should be for him. But uh, I'm, I, I'm truly humbled by, 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 by this experience, um, and it's also a, um, a, well, it's a lovely day and a lovely crowd. Um, I could never have imagined something like this all those years ago, being 13, 14 years old, and my father coming home with those books that I could stand up here. Um, it's truly uh, one of the great honors of my life, let alone my writing life. I wish my kids were here. <laughs> there is a photo in this book on page 237. Um, it's a photo of the Twin Towers taken in August 1974. Um, it's Philippe Petit on the tightrope um, going across um, between, the, between the two towers. It was taken by a man called Victor Lucia, um, who was a photographer for the at the time for the New York Post, later worked for the New York Times. He took it with a 400 millimeter lens. Um, and I attributed it to one of my characters, another piece of like fiction shaping, non-fiction, taking a non-fiction event and, 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 and acquiring it for fiction for the deeper purposes of maybe saying something. Um, but 
Victor Lucia very generously allowed me to have the photograph and to own it because I knew I had my novel the day that um, I saw this photograph because in the top left hand corner there's a plane going across the sky and um, it looks as if the plane is about to smash into um, the building. And, um, and so then I wrote this little bit about the, um, the photograph and it's actually the fourth generation uh, young lady. She is not a prostitute. Um, her name, uh, she, she's Tilly's granddaughter, Jaslyn's daughter, and um, she has changed uh, her world and, and, and um, things around her. I don't want to give too much away f in, for, for those who haven't read it. I haven't read it myself in ages either. It's like, that's the funny thing. I, would not, I, I can't go back to read my own novels, it would be... <laughs> I did it once, I did it once with, a, with, with an earlier novel called Song Dogs, and I said, oh, that's dreadful, who wrote that pile of dung? <laughs> so, I just have little sections that I just, like, jump into. It's called Roaring Seaward and I Go, which is a line from Tennyson. The book comes from a line from Tennyson. Um, I'm in love with poets and poetry, um, and I, I, I rely on them. As I said, we get our voice from the voices of others. Roaring seaward, and I go. October 2006. She often wonders what it is that holds that man so high in the air. What sort of ontological glue? Up there in his haunted silhouette, a dark thing against the sky, a small stick figure in the vast expanse, the plane on the horizon, the tiny thread of rope between the edges of the buildings, the bar in his hands, the great spread of space. The photo was taken on the same day her mother died. It was one of the reasons she was attracted to it in the first place. The sheer fact that such beauty had occurred at the same time. She had found it, yellowing and torn, in a garage sale in San Francisco four years ago, at the bottom of a box of photographs. The world delivers its surprises. She bought it, got it framed, kept it with her as she went from hotel to hotel. A man high in the air while a plane disappears, it seems, into the edge of the building, one small scrap of history meeting a larger one, as if the walking man were somehow anticipating what would come later. The intrusion of time and history, the collision point of stories. We wait for the explosion, but it never occurs. The plane passes, the tightrope walker gets to the end of the wire, things don't fall apart. And it strikes her now as an enduring moment. The man alone against scale, still capable of myth in the face of all other evidence. Thank you.